I, I love the idea that uh, this wonderful space was once a temple of techno. It seems just the right kind of place to be discussing Martin's ideas. Thank you very much to all the invitation to be able to speak here today and share some thoughts. <clears throat> the uncanny quality of Martin's capacity for listening occasionally brought to my mind a saying in the American South that everyone brings something to the party. Martin was profoundly democratic in his ideas, of course, but he was also, I felt, democratic in his daily human relations. He seemed to operate on the generous assumption that the random person in front of him had insights that drawn out might generate something new. That he was alert to dissonances, voices that didn't stay on tune, was striking to me, particularly because he had a great deal else to do. We've all seen people in his situation become instrumental in their social relationships, working steadily down the development office hit list. But somehow, he reserved the capacity to sift through the experiences of not obviously useful strangers and to locate value, contributions to fields those individuals might know nothing of. It's a fugitive gift that determination to be surprised by insight and knowledge instead of summing up a person on the basis of a stereotype. And it's a more vital gift today than when he left us. In thinking about what the conference program calls unfinished tasks, I could almost hear Martin complaining, unfinished tasks? Too mild a phrase for the present reality. Since his death, the tasks confronting the realms of culture have proliferated and become more contested. As Martin saw what was coming in the last year of his life, his usual optimism of the will had cause to falter. But he said of himself, disingenuously, that he wasn't a dreamer, he was a worker. And with that tension between the ideal and the practical in mind, let me offer five tentative thoughts about our difficult future, each of them grounded in Martin's bedrock values. Value one, a belief in the stubborn humanity of people, even those who might do unspeakable things. Martin's clarity on ethics and democratic principle never excluded a critical nuance. The criticism of politicians and political movements mustn't dehumanize the ordinary people on the opposite side. To Martin, no individual, no country, no culture was entirely a write-off. He believed in the capacity of humans to be better than the systems under which they lived. And a lesson I hope he leaves with all of us is the imperative to engage humanely, even with that which we find distasteful. Second, I take from Martin the necessity of reimagining communication. He died just as fake news was becoming a central term of public life. But he already understood that in the future, expertise poorly and unimaginatively communicated would be worthless coin. The work ahead now is to communicate, and not tribe to tribe, coterie to coterie, but across professional boundaries and institutional silos. And that will require some shelving of status pride. Curators and museums come with big egos, Martin noted. Too big when the future is about sharing information, not just across the art and cultural worlds, but, but across the worlds of trade, foreign offices, NGOs, and the military too. Looking forward, I, I would suggest that if ever there was a moment for further ego deflation and deepened cooperation, which will depend on a willingness to speak in order to be understood, not to display one's mastery of lingua arcana. If ever there was such a time, it is now. Third, connected. I take from Martin and I share with him the necessity of deeper, more equal, more nuanced collaboration across cultures, not as a trend of the moment, but as the future of how knowledge will be produced. I don't need to tell you that Martin respected expertise and scholarship. He personally cherished rigor. But he was intent, too, to bring outsiders into the conversation, to create collaborative intellectual adventures. 
When he and I met just over a decade ago, he invited me to see what he was doing in Dresden. And then we drove, or hurtled really, because he was driving, back to Berlin, speaking nonstop about what museums were for and how we saw the world. Before long, with Joachim Nettelbeck, the legendary secondary, secretary of the Wissenschaftskolleg, we hatched a plan to gather from India and Europe a group of art historians and scholars of art, museum practitioners and critics, to discover what their preoccupations were, to what extent they might be shared or diverge. This experiment was one strand in a larger network with the ungainly name of the Indian European Advanced Research Network, which met in Berlin, Calcutta, Delhi, and London over the next few years. Martin recognized that cultural institutions of the West needed the non-West simply to survive into the 21st century. His was not a mission of benevolent rescue. There was a clear financial imperative. But even as he went in clear-eyed, the first few rounds of our collaboration were a bit of a dud. The European art historians, scholars, and museum professionals operated with settled definitions of their field, what art is, what a museum is, and what the relationship between the two is. Their presentations embodied meticulous scholarship, spoke to marvelous conservation projects, but little dialogue was provoked by their set pieces. Their Indian counterparts' concerns about teaching, about doing research, about building cultural institutions were different and more raw. In India, the very definition of their field, art, was blurry. Did art have any stable identity in relation to religion, to folk practices, to politics, in a society where all these elements were vividly alive? And where was art, whatever it might be, best collected and displayed? The institution of the museum was itself problematic in India, a colonial legacy inherited by a nationalist state. Should these established, ill-run institutions be the focus of attention? Or the new private collections of India's narcissistic rich? Where, is that where art was at? Or what about the citizen museums that were coming up all over India? As the Indians in the group argued with one another and the Europeans looked on with bemusement, it became apparent just how deeply art and culture are zones of conflict, conflict in India, where battles are fought over who owns culture and heritage, who gets to define it. A land where books are burned, paintings and galleries destroyed, artists exiled, and mosques and so on attacked. But if the pre preoccupations of Indian colleagues felt alien to Europeans on first class, Martin wasn't put off. The intellectual and cultural diplomacy that interested Martin and that interests me is a difficult anthropological enterprise requiring hermeneutic skills, patience, and challenges to professionally ingrained habits. As Martin once put it, I quote him, cultural diplomacy has to mean more than sending objects around the globe. And to that I would add, Intellectual diplomacy must mean more than sending smart people to deliver pol polished lectures around the globe. Exchanging ideas across cultural and political contexts, building collaborative research agendas that don't mesh with the current pressures of academia, these things will be hard and take time, and, and they will be worth it. The fourth thing I learned from Martin involved the moments when something isn't worth it. He was a master of cutting his losses, I admired how he knew when to drop a bad idea and his lack of sentiment in steering around duff ones. That decision-making quality is profoundly important because there's work to be done and who has time to waste. The fifth thing I take from Martin is that conflict avoidance is a trap. Facing conflict is the start of the answer. His vision was shaped by his historical sense of the omnipresence of conflict and the ever-present possibility of destruction. Museums, cultural institutions, were not in any simple sense refuges from such conflict. They were precisely born out of conflicts, born in a sense because of them, and therefore had to find ways to speak to and about such conflicts. Museums have both prospered from the opportunities given to them by conquest and war, by unequal economic and power relations, 
but they've also played a vital function of protection and preservation in times of conflict. Cultural criticism and institutional self-criticism, Martin understood, are not mutually exclusive. In fact, without one, the other is useless. It's something worth holding on to in a moment when the lines between right and wrong seem bright, and the impulse to be self-righteous is a potent one. If museums might once have been happy to assert civilizational hierarchy, they've learned in recent years to see their role quite differently. Now their default position is to be far more nuanced and accommodating of difference. The culture at large is applying more pressure too. The biggest superhero movie of the year, Black Panther, pivots on the liberation of African objects from the Museum of Great Britain, a thinly disguised British museum. And that's all to the good but it's just a beginning. It's rare to see museums try to consider questions about inequalities of power beyond the usual provenance-related debates. More often, such questions get sanitized as cultural institutions today strive to create the illusion of a non-hierarchical world. Does it follow that museums should become contrite and defensive? No, it doesn't but they do need to show a capacity for brutal self-examination, to historicize themselves, a willingness to experiment in telling different stories about the past and allowing others in to begin to tell their own stories. Martin himself did exactly that in the first museum he led, the German Hygiene Museum in Dresden. If ever there was a museum with dark origins and a troubled past, it was this one a temple to eugenics and later to Nazi racism. But Martin turned it on its head. While respecting and preserving each object in itself, he reframed the collections to subvert and eviscerate their original purposes. He made it the ultimate disobedient museum. That model, the integrity of conservation and respect for objects, combined with a sense of the plasticity of their meanings, and an energetic political reimagination of the stories those objects could tell. That still seems to me, still seems to me to be one of our great unfinished tasks ahead. To put it differently, the need to combine a care for and an interest in the past with a constant argument with it. Arguments out of which we can orient ourselves towards the future and imagine it differently. So that, it seems to me, is something we need to move ahead with. Take wealth and income inequality, for instance, and see how the implications can be explored rigorously in museums that are themselves emblems and embodiments of spectacular hereditary wealth. They're objects accumulated by further wealth, old and new. How can institutions engage bravely with such questions without defensiveness? and apply that same spirit of questioning to issues of race in cultural institutions, defined by, confined by, their whiteness, as the Carters, otherwise known as Beyonce and Jay-Z, just under underlined in that video they sprung on the world this week. These, I think, are among the unfinished tasks ahead, the urgent work we face. So let me stop there. I look forward to collaborating and to listening, as he would wish us to do. Thank you.